Hey, good morning. Welcome to Highland Park Community Church. We're so glad you're here. We're going to start our services off with uh, baptism today. And uh, man, if you're a guest with us, whether you're online or here in the room, we're just so grateful that you're here. For those of you coming on in, come on in, man. It's going to be great. I just want to explain what you're about to see here for a second. Some people are going to get in here and they're going to tell you about Jesus. What I just want to be really clear about is that Jesus has already been made new. They've already received forgiveness of their sins. When they go under the water today, it is representative of the fact that they have died with Christ. When they're under the water, that's representative of them being buried with Christ. And when they come up out of that water, that is representative of new life in Jesus Christ. And so uh, when they come up, man, if you would just cheer and celebrate with all of heaven and us, that would be great. I think ba uh, Bailey's going to come in here first. She goes, Mike, I oh, Bailey's already here. So thanks for jumping in. Thanks for doing this. And is there anything you would want them to know about today? So I was actually baptized as a baby, but as I go through my faith journey, um, God has just put it on my heart for a while now, and the nudges just keep getting stronger to choose for myself to do this um, for so many reasons, but to ultimately um, continue to guide and be an example for our children. Our two boys actually get front row seats back here with us. Um, which is just so amazing. And then our daughter. Um, and I so often have people ask me, when did you know Jesus? When, like, and that for me has always been a tough question. Uh, my parents, my whole life have been my biggest disciples. Um, so I've never not known Jesus. Um, but I've had ups and downs where my faith has connected with Jesus. And I think those would be my testimonies. I've had times where he was nowhere in sight in times where I've really reconnected and grown, and this is one of them. Um, my biggest thing is to continue to disciple our kids, and hopefully one day they can say the same thing, that, what do you mean, I've always known Jesus. Um, our boys recently just told us both that they both have died to self and given their lives to God, so... Hopefully, by watching mom and dad do this next step in our faith journey, they'll understand and one day decide to do that for themselves as well. That's awesome, baby. <laughs> Bailey, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah. How's everyone doing? I'm uh, Kellen. I'm Bailey's husband. Um, so I also was baptized um, as an infant in a Lutheran church. And I think I went to church nine times after that um, Christmas Eve service until my grandma passed away. And then we just never went again. Um, <clears throat> so then I kind of just uh, muttered through and thought I was a good person. So that was good enough. Um, and then I met my wife. And she brought me here, actually, in 2018. Um, and we've been pretty much coming here every Sunday since. Um, anybody that knows me, if I do something, it's full send all the way, no matter what, which makes it a little problematic to play Mario Kart against the kids because <clears throat> they never win. Um, <laughs> but uh, probably eight or nine months ago, um, I did it already in the privacy of my own heart and mind to give myself to Christ. But I've been having conversations with God, um, probably look like a crazy person in my office, um, talking to myself, but, um, you know, I felt like it was probably time to do a public declaration, um, to die to self, to pick up my cross and follow Christ full send. Uh, Kellen, because of your faith in Jesus Christ his deep love for you and your deep love for him. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's awesome. Woo. 
Travis, that was a deep breath right there, yeah. man. I'm not really too good on the whole public speaking, but the reason I'm here today is mostly because for many years I kind of thought I was better on my own, pushed away Jesus. I thought all my accomplishments were mine and mine alone. And, you know, 2022, I kind of really had some hard times and stuff. And to the spirit of Jesus and Bailey and Kellen, their first response was come to church with us just to listen, just to be part of it and being around you guys and being around my good friend Laura and stuff like that. Just the spirit of God just kept talking to me and talking to me and it brought me here and I'm ready to go full fledged or full send as my friend Kellen said and give my life to Jesus and be a better person for it. Travis, I just kind of feel impressed to just, yes, there you go, man. <laughs> I just, this is, this is for you. Uh, I want you to know that God's love is perfect and he's not going to love you because of your behavior. And it like, he just loves you and he invites you to align all of you with him and just keep leaning into that brother. Keep leaning into that. And this is a big Absolutely. step in that. Travis, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and his deep, deep love for you, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Come on, man. Come on. If at some point you too would like to come and make a public declaration of Jesus, I want to just invite you to be a part of that. But Lord God, what an amazing start to an amazing day to hear of your saving grace and your unfailing love and your invitation to walk with you and that your perfect love would guide and lead us. Today we're here, Lord, to praise your name. You're the God of miracles. You're the God who takes people dead in their sins and makes them come alive to Christ. Lord, in just a second, the, the music is gonna start. There'll be words up on the screen. But our hearts, it's an offering to you today. Accept our praise is offering to you and just how good you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with us?
give him some, go ahead and give him some praise. You guys pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this worship that we can come to you with anything, Lord, and that we can trust you because you are trustworthy, because you are faithful, God, in the storms, in the good times, in the bad times, that you are greater than our ups and downs. And so we lay it down at the foot of your cross this morning, Lord. I pray that the people in this room, the people watching on the other side of monitors this morning, that you would move in their hearts. Help us to get out of the way, Lord. Speak to us as only the living God can. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read this. Go ahead and sit down, guys. I want to read this verse over you guys. And we're just going to spend a minute in it. It's from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. You've probably heard them before. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Are you there today? Is he Lord of your life? He is a good savior. We can call out to him in our times of need, God help, and he'll be right there. But is he your king? Is he your Lord? That's such a harder thing. I remember in the beginning of my faith journey, in the beginning of my recovery, and I said, God, I, I can't do this. I need you, help me. I give all of this to you. And he said, okay. And remember that man that hurt you when you were a child, all those years ago? Forgive him. What? Not that, Lord. I can't do that. Do you know what he did to me? He knew. And when I see mountains, he sees a mountain moved. When I see ashes, he sees beauty. And when I see a cross, he sees an empty tomb. And when I gave it to him, when I surrendered full send, and I forgave him, what it meant was I was no longer a victim. When I trust him, when I seek him, When I surrender, he knows what you're going through, whatever it is, whatever you walk through here with this morning. He loves you. Just take a second, tell him that you love him. Sorry, man. I'm so glad you guys came to worship this morning. That was some powerful music, yeah? So thankful for this worship team that we get to worship with every week. My name is Adam. I'm the youth pastor for Celebrate Recovery. Thank you for coming this morning. We're so glad you're here, whether it's in the room with us or on the other side of a monitor. And uh, 
we're excited to continue to dive into Romans this morning. And uh, I just want you to prepare your hearts for that message. In the next few minutes, as Mike's coming to the stage, just give Jesus some praise in your personal space. I love you guys. Thank you. Oh, there we go. There, hello? Hello? Did it come back? No. All right. There we go. Hey, so um, I want to start by just telling you a story, but the story's got a lot of different faces to it, and so we're just going to look at that, and, and it's to get you excited about missions. Uh, missions, Faith Promise is coming up, and the story I'm going to tell you is from the book that I shared with you a couple weeks ago the insanity of God, and just how amazing God is. What I want you to picture is that this really happened. I don't know the country. I just know that there's this Muslim guy named Pramana. And Pramana was having a hard time getting along with his wife. Pramana was having a hard time getting along with his kids. His crops weren't growing. His life was falling apart. So he did what any Muslim would do. He went and saw the imam. Now I'm gonna put it in my, like the imam, this is just layman's terms. It's like the spiritual advisor for the Muslim people, like be going to see your pastor. And the imam says this, I want you to go grab a chicken, bring it back here. I'm gonna sacrifice that chicken for you. And then you're gonna go home and you're gonna fast for three days and three nights. And at the end of three days and three nights, you'll have your answer to all of your problems. So the guy goes, Muslim dude goes, grabs a chicken, they sacrifice that thing, goes home, and he meditates and he fasts for three days, three nights. And on that last night of his fasting, remember, the answer to all of his problems is gonna be revealed. In the middle of the night, on that last night, the way that Pramana describes it is the voice with no body. The voice with no body tells him to go find Jesus, to go find the gospel. He says, Pramana, I want you to get up out of your bed right now, and I want you to go to a city that you've never gone to before. When you get to the city, you're going to find two men. And when you find these two men on the street, I want you to walk up to them and ask for this street number. And then you go follow that, and I want you to knock on the door. Just do that gets up out of his bed and he goes over the mountain into a city he's never been before and wouldn't you know it there are two people two men standing on the on the street he walks up to him and he says hey i was sent to you and uh can you tell me where this street and this address is and they said yeah it's right over here he walked down the street he finds the address he knocks on the door the door opens and says can i help you and promises yeah i'm here to find jesus 
The dude physically accosts him, pulling him into the house, gets down in his face, and he's like, what are you Muslims trying to do? Do you think I'm going to fall for this, this ploy so easy? And Pramana says, because it's illegal to be a follower of Jesus in this, uh, in this, in this country, he says, Jesus sent me here. I'm here to find Jesus, and he sent me here for you to tell me about him. The guy leads Pramana to Jesus Christ, where he is now a disciple and he is leading people to Jesus in a persecuted country. I want to tell you that story for a few reasons. One, I want to let you know missions is coming, and I want you to be excited about missions. The God that we just talked about is doing that, not only in the United States, he's drawing men and women to himself in amazing ways all around the world. And in a few weeks, the first two weeks of February, You're invited to hear how God is moving around the world, and it is going to be good for all of our souls. But not only do we get to hear how God is moving, we get to be involved with it. And we can be involved in it in one of three ways, and and the one is like, don't, like, if, if you've never done this before, this is not cheating. But we get to pray that the Holy Spirit would move in powerful, powerful ways, and I want to encourage all of us to pray. But everybody's like, I can pray because it's easier than these next two asks. I'm going to ask you right now to begin to pray, Lord, how can I partner with you around the world? You may never go to this country. I may never go to this country. But there are men and women who are. So, and not just that country, but with our Faith Promise partners. So I'm saying, come up with a dollar amount. Ask God what that dollar amount is. It's personal between you and God. It's all his money anyway. Ask him, say, Lord, what do you want me to pledge so that I can be a part here in Casper, Wyoming, of you doing work like that all around the world. I know you don't need me, but you're inviting me into it, and I want you to hear this very clearly. God is inviting you to partner with him in missions all around the world. I want you to think about that. I also want to think I'm going to spoil somebody's family vacation right now. I'm going to spoil somebody's anniversary right now. I'm not saying you have to, and this is the guilt-free zone. But if you've never been on a mission trip... Make that that 25th anniversary trip. Baby, I'm going to take you to where there's lots of mosquitoes and mosquito nets and humidity outside of our ever-loving mind, but we're going to see Jesus move in amazing ways. There's an idea. Take a family vacation. Just go. Go check out. Don't make make the mission trip a vacation. It's not that. But if you've never been, you should go. So I'm telling you that reason that way, but I also said it's got many faces. The other face of it is this. Maybe this morning you're like Pramana, and things in your home aren't going well. Things in your relationships aren't going well. Or maybe it's not your home, maybe it's just your work life, maybe it's just life in general, and it just feels like it's going down the tubes. How did God change Pramana's life? We're like, well, he, he changed it. He changed Pramana's life. God's love changes and transforms us. How did he make Promise Home and relationships better? His love. His love, the love of God, transformed that man on the inside out, and his family experienced that. And so what I'm saying is if you're going through a hard time today, very clearly, Jesus wants to help you. You're saying, Lord, help my family. In order for him to help your family, in order for him to help you, You've got to let his love transform you first. How do you do that? You admit your own brokenness, your own sin, and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. That's it. And say, teach me. Teach me to love the way that you love. And his love will come in and love you, and it'll transform your life. And that's for somebody this morning. Earlier this week, I got one of my favorite texts. Last week, this is all on purpose. I had a friend at the Detroit Lions game. I was getting messages from him. Oh, it felt so good. And he sends me this text on Wednesday. He said, Mike, it was so loud in Ford Field that that the decibel levels was equivalent to a jet engine. It was so loud that the decibel levels sounded like a jet engine. We've been losing for 32 years. I'm not going to lie to you, there was a part of me, the Detroit Lions fan part of me, that just sat in there and was like, oh my goodness, that feels so good. And as quickly as that moment came, and it wasn't because I'm a pastor, 
He caught me in the middle of a Bible study while I was doing this. And I was like, it was as loud as a jet engine. And these people have been in a drought for 32 years. And by these people, I mean we. I'm part of those people. And they hurt and they ache over it. And it's, I'm just telling you the story, and it's true. God knows it's true. I'm not lying to you. I ask myself this question. Do I care about people's souls being lost? And does my heart ache for souls being lost the way a Lions fan does for losing for 32 years? This week I got to sit with several people and over the past month and over the past years I've been able to sit with some of you and you have prodigals. You've got kids, you've got spouses, you've got family and your heart aches over that. That's a good ache. I don't want my heart to ache over a crazy football game because a season is just a season. But a soul being lost is for an eternity. And I would just say, God, give us a heart that not only hurts for our loved ones not walking with you, but for people, our neighbors, our city, our state, our country. And then I got to thinking, and you're wondering, this is all tying into Romans, by the way. And then I got to thinking, it was as loud as a jet engine. Now, if you've ever been to a passion conference with college kids in Atlanta, Georgia, I think it probably gets that real close to that. But I was like, what would it look like for our hearts to be so in love with Jesus that when we see the kingdom of God win, we, are comp- like we cannot help but scream and shout and declare a victory in Jesus' name that would be so loud and so full of joy that somebody would equate that to a jet engine. So I shared the thoughts with the guy that sent them to me. And his response was, well, we're in the book of Romans, man. Give him the power of the gospel and let's go and let's see what God wants to do. So you'll see how this all ties in together. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to, uh, to Romans chapter 9. I want to give you this backdrop and you're going to see how this fits in. That story fits into what we're talking about pretty, pretty early on. But uh, what I want you to know is over the next three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, it is a conversation within a conversation. What I mean by that is that the book of Romans is all about the power of the gospel. It is the, how the gospel is for both Jew and Gentile. It is the story of how God is transforming lives through his son Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit opening people's eyes, removing scales and from their eyes so that they can see the wickedness in them and that they can claim life and victory in Jesus' name, that is what this is all about. But I want you to know that the conversation within the conversation over the next three chapters is just with the Jewish people. Why is this just with the Jewish people? It's because the church in Rome is mostly made up of Gentiles, non-Jewish people, people like you and me. There are more Gentile converts, more Roman converts, than Jewish converts in the church. And the Jewish people are a little miffed. What are they miffed about? Well, they're God's chosen people. They're like, man, God gave us the patriarchs like Abraham and Moses. He gave us the prophets. He gave us his word. He gave us the law. He chose us out of all the nations. And they're a little put out that now God's including Gentiles. That's creating heartburn for them because they feel special. And and what they're trying to do, you guys, is they're trying to put God in a box that makes them feel good. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever try to put God and your understanding of God in a box so that you can feel good about you? We've all done it before. That's what's going on here. That's part, of their, that's part of their deal. And they're having a hard time trying to get their head around faith in Jesus versus following the law. And in doing that, they are completely missing out on the fact that Jesus did not come to abolish the law. 
He came to fulfill the law, to obey it to the, to the letter, to the T. And how did he do that? Not out of divinity, but the power of the Holy Spirit in him. And that everybody, nobody could follow that law, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ did. And that anybody who puts their faith in him, because of his death and resurrection, God credits to them the righteousness of Christ. Not on what we've done, but, what on Christ, but because of what Christ did for us. And we do that by faith, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah who died on the cross for our sins. God rose him from the dead. And when we put our faith in him, we become the righteousness of Christ. God credits to us the righteousness of Christ. And by faith, we can have peace with God, relationship with God. We can be forgiven of our sins. And on top of all of that, we get eternal life. Not the way that you live eternal life now. The way that God had planned long ago in the Garden of Eden, which is so much better and is so hard for us to get our heads around. And so you need to know that as we read these next few chapters, the Jews have been largely rejecting Jesus. And Paul, out of love, is having a conversation within a conversation. And he wants to bring as many Jewish people along with him as he possibly can. And in this passage, oh my goodness, you guys, there's so much great stuff in this passage. I won't be able to do justice to it all. And I hope that in your groups you will be able to do justice to this. Because one of the great theological debates of all time is actually rooted in the passage that we're going uh, to look at today about election, meaning God chose me, versus free will, God chose me and I get to choose. So that is rooted in here. And um, I'm just so excited to be able to open this up with you. I've entitled this message today, Broken Hearted and Unmerited Grace. He's brokenhearted. Paul is brokenhearted, but he's still believing. In the famous words of the theologian rock band, Journey. Don't ever stop believing. Don't ever stop believing in the power of the gospel. Don't ever stop believing in God's love for you. Don't ever stop believing that God is for you. Don't ever stop believing that he cares about that loved one that you've been praying for. And don't ever stop going and sharing your love with Christ's love with them. All right, here we go. Paul says in Romans chapter 9, we'll look at the first six verses, and then we'll look at a few short verses after that. Paul chapter 9, verse 1. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I, could, uh, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sonship. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. I want to go back to verse 2 because Paul's already said he's not lying and he confirms it through the Holy Spirit. But I want to ask you a question. Why does Paul have such great sorrow? And it's not just any kind of sorrow. He says he has great anguish in his heart. Well, the first, first, six, the first six verses tell us why. Why is he so anguished? He's so anguished because his countrymen the people, his, his fellow countrymen. He doesn't even know all these people. But the Jewish people, of which he is a descent, he is Jewish. Why does his heart ache? It's because they are rejecting the gospel. More often than not, they are rejecting the gospel. And why does Paul's heart ache over that? Because he is so convinced of the goodness of God and the power of the gospel. He is so convinced that nothing in this world can compare to doing daily life with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. He is so convinced 
of the wickedness of sin. He is so convinced that the judgment and condemnation that comes along with wickedness and evil is so horrible that the thought of his countrymen going to hell, not because God's sending them there, they're choosing that. God's just giving them what they want. The thought of them not, the thought of them missing out on the gospel brings an anguish to his heart that no Detroit Lions fan could ever experience or feel even after 32 years of, of losing. But some of you in this room know what that feels like. Because your spouse, your son, your brother, your daughter isn't walking with Jesus. And it aches in ways that only the Holy Spirit can groan. Paul wants so deeply for all people to experience the gospel, it moves in his heart. It compels him. He talks about it. I know because I've gotten to do life with you for 10 years. You guys care deeply for people. You guys love people like Jesus. Keep going. But the prayer that I'm asking God, break our hearts for what breaks yours. That we would be so full of the Holy Spirit that our souls would ache at the idea of our neighbors not going to Jesus. How bad does Paul want this? How bad does he want it? I'll tell you, he tells us. I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race. If you've got a kid in here, if you've got a grandkid in here, would you just raise your hand? And I'm just having you do this so you're not alone. Just raise them up high. You took a shower this morning. If you didn't, it won't stink that bad anyway. How many of you would do absolutely anything to spare your kid some pain? How many would do almost anything even if it meant giving your life to spare your kid, your grandkid, some kind of tormenting pain. Maybe some of you in this room have even said, I'd trade places with you. I want you to know that Paul's not the first one to, to, to say something like this. I, I just want to quickly show you this. If we go back to uh, Exodus, look at, this is Moses. This is, Moses has been up getting the law. He's been in the presence of God and the people down below are freaking out for no reason. They think they got a reason, but God hasn't left them and they've got the golden calf and, and so they've sinned against God. And the next day Moses said to the people, you've committed a great sin, but now I'm gonna go back up to the Lord. Perhaps I could make atonement for your sin. Perhaps my pleading with you will, will like God will just take it easy. Perhaps we'll have mercy. So Moses goes back up to the Lord and he says, what a great sin these people have committed. They've made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if you don't, then blot me out in the book that you've written. Just blot me out. In essence, he's like, man, this is horrible. Please, don't, don't attach me to this. But man, if you'll make some kind of atonement, even me. Jesus, Palm Sunday, Luke 19, 41 through 44. Jesus says, as he, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, and he's speaking about the, the Jewish people, he's speaking about the Jewish people in Jerusalem. If only you had known on this day what would bring you peace. If only you would have known the gospel. If only you would have recognized me. If only you wouldn't have rejected me. It would have brought you peace. But now it's going to be hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you. They'll encircle you and they'll hem you in on every side. That actually happened in 70 AD where Rome surrounded and took Jerusalem. And what's going to happen in there? Well, verse 44, it's not very pretty. But he tells them what's coming. And those people who surround your wall, they'll dash you to the ground. And your kids within your walls. And they won't leave one stone on one another because you did not recognize that the time of God came to you. 
And we see that Jesus' heart is aching. And we're seeing that Paul's heart aches in a similar way. But Paul knows deep down, Paul knows deep down that him offering himself is not enough to save. Only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can save. So Paul's sacrifice would be unnecessary and unsuccessful because it's not enough to save. But his heart aches so deeply. Only Jesus can save. So he then begins, he's broken hearted about the spiritual condition. He's so broken hearted <clears throat> about the spiritual condition. This is where we're going to get to. He never stopped believing. He never stopped believing in the power of the gospel. He never stopped doubting God's love for them. And now he's going to have a conversation with them. But before we get to that conversation, and I'll, I'll handle it quickly. Why does Paul keep believing? Why does Paul keep preaching? Why does he never give up? Why does he keep getting after it? It's because that's what he was born to do. Jesus told him at his conversion all the way back in Damascus and into the city when Ananias came and spoke to him, Paul, you are going to be my missionary to the Gentiles and to people. That was his command. It was to go and to proclaim the gospel. He didn't get a choice whether he stopped or not. He didn't have time for a pity party or not. It was the reason for which he was born. It was the mission to which he was called. That's why he kept going. Highland Park Community Church, those who are listening, we have been given the same mandate. In Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, all authority on heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new believers to obey all my commands. In order for us to teach believers these new disciples' commands, we have to be obeying the commands in the first place. To do what? To go and make disciples of Jesus. That is what Paul is doing here in the church. His heart breaks for his countrymen. He is compelled by the gospel. He is commanded by the king to go. And he is just being obedient there's not one person in the well there, there may be one or two I'm not that I wouldn't be one of those two we all have some obedience to step into the purpose for which you were born is not to make the best living that you can that's the cherry on top the job that you've been given, the life that you've been given, is a gift. Everything that we have is a gift. It is an avenue to step into relationship with people to which we are to make disciples. That awesome job that you worked your tail off and you're like, "Woo, I made it, is just an avenue to share the gospel. For my brothers and sisters in here who are retired, oh, Lord Jesus, one day. But that doorway is not a doorway to retirement from the kingdom. It is just the next pathway to making disciples. For those of you who love sports, you kids that love sports, who sports are good. That is just a vehicle being on a team for you to be a teammate to share the gospel. May what break our God's heart break our hearts the way it broke Paul's. And like, man, now, 
I'm going to just fly through these next verses and again, I, I can't do them justice in six minutes, but I'm going to try. He just starts talking to his brothers and sisters. It's not as though God's word had failed. For not all of those descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it's all through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it's not the children's physical descent who are God's kids, but it's the children of promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I'm going to return and Sarah's going to have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the exact same time by our father. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, <coughs> in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, Rebecca was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Hmm, cringe. Okay, all right, cool. Paul is telling his Jewish brothers and sisters, his countrymen, going all the way back to around verse 4, God has given you everything. He's chosen you. He's given you the law. He's made his spirit dwell among you in the temple, in the tabernacle. He led you up out of Egypt. He's given you the prophets. He's given you Abraham. He's given you Moses. And you still reject them. Man, I sit and I think about how many times we proclaim the gospel over and over and over and over again, week in and week out, that salvation is found in Jesus Christ, the confession of sin, the confessing of our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and that nobody gets to the Father except through him, and yet people continually ignore, 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 just like these Jewish folks. They just ignored. Why did they ignore? Because self was in the way. They couldn't get out of their own way. It wasn't that God didn't want it for them. It's just that they were unwilling to step out of self. Why do people ignore today, today, today? Because we love pleasure and comfort more than we love anything else. We hate being uncomfortable. We just want to stack pleasure on pleasure on pleasure on pleasure. And we think it's going to last forever, but the truth is, is that you're not and it's not. We are part of a dying world. And people keep rejecting. And Paul kept preaching. So we're going to keep preaching. And he speaks to them in a very specific tone. And he says, you are depending on your lineage to get you there. You are you are depending on the law, your adherence of the law to get you there. And he's been saying the law can't save you. And Abraham can't save you. And this is where we get into unmerited grace. Oh, this is so beautiful. Because we read that Abraham had two sons. Isaac was the promise through which Israel would come. But God took a while in answering that prayer. So Abraham said, I'll, I'll solve this. Sarah said, I'll solve this. And he slept with his wife's maid and took her as a wife. And they had a son named Ishmael. Man, you wanna talk about crazy, wacky family dynamics. If you think yours is crazy, it ain't that crazy. And it went off the rails. But God was so faithful and he's like, I'm not choosing Ishmael, but I'm gonna love Ishmael. And I'll make him a nation. It's a nation in the Arab nation today. But even though Ishmael was a descendant there are many people in that nation who are not walking with God, not walking with Jesus. But there was another son, Isaac, who God would birth the nation of Israel through. And he had two sons. And before those two sons were born, he had Jacob and Esau. Before they had done anything right or before they had done anything wrong, God chose to use Jacob. That's unmerited grace. God has a choice. And what he was trying to communicate to the Jewish people is, listen, God gets to choose that the Gentiles get to be a part. It's been the plan from all, all along. So you need to get over that. God has a choice. And he chose Jacob. Jacob and Esau hadn't done anything wrong. And we read that, and I need to clear this up for you, is that it says, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. He did not hate Esau the way that you hate things or the way that I hate things. That word means election. 
God chose. And it's in this passage that we get into election like versus free will. Some would call it Calvinism, some would call it Arminianism. That God chose you and some people are like, well, I didn't have a choice, I'm just a puppet. And then there's free will where we get to choose. And, and here's how we land on that as a church. But before I tell you how we land as a church, whether you lean towards election or you lean towards free will, what I love about both parties is that both camps believe Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Nobody gets the Father except through him. So no matter where you land on that spectrum, you are welcome here. They've been debating that for eons, and they haven't landed on that and made it perfect. Both have great scriptural references. We land on free will, and here's why. God chose Jacob because he's gonna become a nation. God didn't choose Esau to be the nation for which the Messiah came through, but he never stopped loving Esau. In fact, he made Esau a great nation. We read about them in Deuteronomy when God brought them into the promised land. God loved Esau, but Esau and his people weren't saved. Where we come to this is God loves everyone. He wants all people. The gospel is for all who believe. The gospel is for all who believe. The gospel is for all who believe. What does that mean? You have to believe. You have a say in this. But if you're sitting here today having believed, you are not just getting into heaven because you believed. You're getting in because he gave you unmerited grace and you responded to it. But it all depends on Jesus. It all depends on God's love. You got no shot, I got no shot without God extending his love to us. Our part in that is responding to it. And so today, I don't know if you've ever responded. If you've never responded today, you get a chance to respond. And what does that look like? You confess your sins to him, believe in your heart, that he's the Messiah and that God raised, confess that he is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, and then walk with him. You can do that in the privacy of your seat. We just ask that you go out these doors to the left and tell somebody about it. Over at uh, Group Life, tell people at Group Life. We got a Bible for you and everything. And for everybody else, may we, like Paul, preach and proclaim. I gotta go, but I'm gonna tell you a story. I get to get, have lots of Jesus conversations. And Jesus is offensive. And as I was going in there, I thought about saying, hey, if you don't wanna talk about Jesus, we won't talk about Jesus. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing you could ever do. Do not give your authority away to somebody who's perishing. Because you've got an authority that comes from somebody that didn't say give it up. In your Jesus conversations, don't you ever give up your authority. You keep loving, you keep proclaiming, but there may come a time where you just have to trust God and trust him to use somebody else. And here's what I'll tell you. If he can get a crazy Muslim dude in the middle of the night named Pramana to the kingdom of God, he can get anybody there. It does not depend on you. You got a job, don't give up that job. Lord, to your name and your glory forever in the church. Adam, you better come here, man. Amen. All right, well, if this is your first time here, uh, we're grateful you came. We want to connect with you. So before you leave, if you'd go out the doors and go to that place called Go Central, there, oh no, I'm sorry, Group Life, what he was talking about, we got a gift for you. We want to get to know you. If you've been just coming and going through Romans with us and you're not connected with a group yet, that's what we want you to do, man. Get connected with a group, join a community group, be in the Word together. That's how we learn, that's how we grow in relationship with one another, in relationship with Christ. We love you all. Go and be the church, not just here in this building, outside this building. God bless you as you go.